Okay, um, good evening everybody and thank you for staying uh, so long as well and uh, for my last, for the last talk of the evening and I'm just going to talk you through the equine placenta and um, the plan for tonight I've just got to give you an introduction on what is a placenta actually, what is its function, a little bit on anatomy as well and to make it some maybe a bit more comprehensive I will go um, and I will make a comparison between the equine and the human placenta. And we're going to talk about as well about normal findings and finally uh, some abnormalities. So uh, fetal membranes, uh, we call them the allantochorion. So the placenta is the allantochorion, which is um, a composition of allantois, uh, which is the side towards the fall, which you see here and the chorion, which is the side towards um, the uterus, which you see on the, red, uh, on the right side, so which is more a red velvety side. Then the amnion, and I'm sorry, it's not the best picture here, but you will see it later in the video, is the sac in which the fall actually comes. And then you have the placental vasculature with um, the umbilical cord, where you see it here, and then it will be attached to the fetus as well. Um, Catch so the, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Catch I'm not sure yes. you're sharing your screen. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I haven't checked. So um, I'll go through those things. So on the left here, this is what we call. Um, sorry, I'm just going to move this. Yeah. Um, so on the left, you can see the. Um, um, sorry, the chorion, and on the right, the alanto is. Uh, on the left, the alanto is sorry, and the right, the chorion. Uh, but I'll go through that later. And here in the back, you have the amnion with the umbilical cord. Um, um, so the, the function of the placenta is um, it will give oxygen towards the fall um, and then the next thing as well it will give nutrition to the fall which are essential for, um, um, nutri um, for, for the growth and the development of the fall as well waste products of, uh, that are produced by the fall will go back by the umbilical cord towards um, the mare and then will be excreted like that and the placenta is as well a very important uh, for, uh, producer of hormones such as estrogen, progesterone and relaxin during pregnancy. Um, the weight of a normal placenta is about 11% of the uh, fall's body weight at birth and we call the equine placenta um, a diffuse microcotyledonary and endothelial corial. And I'll go through that because it probably sounds a bit like Chinese and I will try to explain why we call that like that. And so on the left, um, you have a picture here of a human placenta and we call the human placenta discoid where we call the equine placenta diffuse and the reason for that is that you see here it's just one area where you have a placenta um, and then here you have the umbilical cord attached towards the fetus. Um, I made a drawing of um, how it looks in, in a horse and so the blue lining here is the uterus and then you have this orange line here which is the alantocorion so the placenta and then in blue, you have the amnion here as well, the lighter blue. So you see that this placenta in the horse is going all around this fetus and it's covering uh, the fetus and, and the complete lining of the uterus. And so the equine placenta is much less efficient in produce, in, in uh, giving those nutrition, giving those oxygen towards its fall. It needs this big surface, whereas in human, uh, in the human species, basically, in women, um, you only need part of the, um, the uterus being in contact with um, um, the uterus. And one of the uh, things where we see that this forms a problem, and that's why, uh, and people often ask me, why can a horse not have twins? What's the problem with that? And it's just due to this inefficiency, because if you live, this is what you normally have on the left-hand side with 
um, the placenta being all, wide, uh, all around the uterus. So the uterus has two horns, and then where the foal will actually, the fetus will develop is what we call the pregnant horn, but the placenta will go all the way into the other horn as well. If you have them twins, there is no space. So um, you'll have here, this bigger one, for example, will have contact here, but it, won't, it will miss all this other horn um, just because there's a lot of fetus in there. And so if you look here on the right, on the right side is this normal placenta. And this is a placenta I found in a med that, um, that was called out for. And they said, that, oh, basically their initial problem was, it's like this, the mare passed a small fall and the placenta looks weird. And when I looked at this placenta, I saw this area here on the bottom and it should have all looked all bright red like that. And basically that is, if you look here on the side again, that's where that placenta had contact with the placenta of, the, of, the tw of his twin. And so there's no contact with the uterus. And um, so it didn't have enough of nutrition and basically both falls um, eventually um, didn't make it just because of their um, um, development was uh, insufficient. And then I said as well, so in, in, in people, um, so when, um, the placenta is called hemochorial. So there is a connection of, um, this is the, the women's blood flow and this is the fetal blood flow. So you see that there's actually um, blood cells going uh, past the placenta towards um, the fetus. In horses, this is not the, uh, the case. We call it epithelial So there's an extra layer in here. And so you have the blood from the mare and the blood from the fetus, and there's no um, exchange of, of antibodies in in fetuses uh, in 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 foals. So foals need um, their antibodies coming from the colostrum, so they don't have any immunity when they're born. Whereas babies do have some immunity. Babies can uh, survive just. Um, on uh, formula horses can't. And that's why as well, we boost their immunity, like Grace has said earlier, uh, by giving a boost of vaccination one month before falling, just because that will increase the antibodies in the colostrum and will enhance the chances of the fall having a sufficient, um, um, sufficient antibodies and, and, and immunity in, in the first months of its life. And then um, this is uh, the microcotyledon. So that's basically the contact that the uh, placenta has with the, um, with the uterus. So on the bottom, this bit here is the uterus. And if you, it just increases the contact. So you have all these kind of uh, protrusions like that, and it just increases the contact like that. So um, just so that, that there's more exchange of nutrition and, and oxygen and so on. So the placenta, like I said, we call it the Alantocorion. So on the left side, again, Alantois, and on the right side, the uh, Corion, so the Corion towards the uterus and the shiny side towards the fetus. And so I have a little video just to show you how it looks inside the mare, and I hope it's all clear. Um, this is the placenta where you see uh, the Alantois side. So when the placenta comes out of the bay, you often have it um, inside out. Um, so this is the side that is towards the fall. Um, where this is the amniotic sac here with your umbilical cord, and you can nicely see all the vessels. Um, you won't see a lot of things going wrong on this side. A lot of pathology you would see on the other side. Uh, but it's important to kind of be sure you have what we call the uterine body, which is here. And then the two horns, and this is the amniotic sac where the four actually lives in, in here with the umbilical cord and the vessels, and then here the opening where the falls comes out actually. And what we then do, once we've seen this side, we turn it inside out because then it gets the more interesting bit. So you kind of move it inside out again. Put all of that in there, and it will make more sense when you see it like that. So we put it back in the F shape, 
And the important thing is to know when you check a placenta if the placenta is indeed complete. And you can only know that by kind of putting it again in that nose F shape like I had before. And this bit you often find as well. And it's what we call the hippomanus. And which no bit of blood you don't see as nicely, but it's just a little kind of spongy thing and it just debris of the of, of the fall and it just comes often together with the fall. So that is what we have. So two horns, and this is what we call the uterine body, and then two uterine horns. And um, you can't feel it now, but basically if you kind of feel like this side, this would be much thicker than this side. And that's because what we call the um, pregnant cord. So this is the horn of the uterus where the fall was it, And it's thicker because it's just been pushed around a bit and the, fall, the hoofs have been pushing here. And that's why it's thicker than here. And so if you would have a look, and I'll come a bit closer to the camera, you have a nice white little spot here. If you see here, there's no no redness there and that is actually the entrance to the upper duct so that's where so normally when you have the whole red thing is what we call microvilli so normally you have the so this is the placenta but it is attached to the uterus and the uterus will have little finger kind of like protrusions and the placenta as well so it's attached like that but at this spot, but at the other duct, there is no contribution of the actual uterus to the placenta, so it's not attached, so it's loose. And so that's why here you have the white little tiny tiny spot, and as well here you will find it back on the tip of the horn. And if you find those two little spots, you know you have had the whole the two horns of the uterus are complete. And then what you can look at as well, if you're here. At the end of the, this is the end, and you will see some white stripes on here as well. You see? That's why, because you don't have, um, have the cervix, and you won't have those microvilli. So, um, it, when you're, so this is how it is in the uterus. So with this side towards the uterus of the bear, and the, you would have the hind, you would have the hind legs in here, its body in here, and its head in there, so it would be fold up like that. And once you will, once part of the will start, he will turn around and so come with his back towards towards the back of the mother, of his mom, of the dam, and he will turn around and then he will stretch his legs out and start pushing here. And that's actually when then this will break. So and that's when the water breaks and then it comes out and you would have then this. Amnion, his, his little legs will still be in the amnion, and that's what you see uh, coming out there. Okay. So, um, a little bit of what other normal findings, which I didn't have on uh, the other one, is often people ask me, they find this heart uh, structure attached to the umbilical cord, and they call me and they say, oh, you've missed a twin, or what is this? And they think there's something wrong. And it's actually what we call a remnant of the yolk sac, and it's a calcification. And um, the yolk sac in the beginning is a part of the normal embryonic development. And in some mares, you, you might just find them back, but there's nothing to be worried about. And your vets have, uh, definitely haven't missed a twin just with, with uh, this present. Another thing you sometimes find is um, those little uh, protrusions. And I've had, a, um, was last year as well, and somebody asked, oh, this, uh, what, what are those? And it just in the beginning um, of uh, the placenta, when the placenta starts to form, you have um, endometrial cups, which we call, it's just the beginning of placentitis, and it, uh, placent, not placentitis, of placentation. And um, they just connected there, but it's absolutely normal. And then indeed the hippomana, which we find here, um, it's just um, al al um, debris and the alanto is that kind of uh, sticks together and um, makes this, this kind of, um, spongy thing, so we, which we call the hippomana.
So then um, I hope but giving just a bit of an insight on normal anatomy and normal findings, it might have made it a bit easier to understand uh, placental pathology. Uh, Paul, I already mentioned the red back delivery, so I'm not going to go um, too much into that, but it is indeed a premature separation of the placenta and it is an emergency. So normally you should see this white sac. If you see a, right, uh, a red one, you need to break it immediately because there is um, no, um, so your um, oxygen supply for your fall is compromised and so the fall needs to come out as well. You will um, have a fall that might need a support afterwards as well and a higher chance of having what we call a dummy fall. Um, then retained placentas, retained fetal membranes. Normally the placenta needs to pass within 30 minutes to three hours. If it takes longer than three hours, we call it a retained placenta and you need to call your vet to get the placenta out. Um, it's one of the most common postpartum problems. Um, and um, there's an increased chance in cases of placentitis, cases of twins, some, some breeds of draft horses and especially Frisian horses have a higher chance of placentitis, uh, fetal, retained fetal membranes and as well in cases of abortion, um, the membranes are often retained. Like Paula, um, so like Paula said, we always try to bind them um, above the hock just because they need the weight of the placenta, the complete weight in slowly kind of releasing that, um, those microvilli and this attachment to the uterus and it will just slowly drop and drop and drop. And if they stand on it, it might tear and then you don't have that weight. And basically that what then happens is that it will be retained or it ruptures quite highly, and then you don't you think the placenta is complete, but actually there's still a part inside. And mares can get very ill with a retained placenta. Um, they can get um, um, toxins, they get laminitis, and they can potentially die if you don't treat them. Um, whereas, for example, in cattle, you can leave them for weeks with a retained placenta, and they were absolutely fine. It's definitely not the case in horses. Um, so like I said, bind the placenta above the hook, never pull on a placenta, because if it ruptures, you kind of causing more problem. As well, you might think that the placenta comes off completely, but you still have small pieces attached. And it makes it difficult as well if you have half a placenta to kind of determine, do we have the complete placenta? Um, and then to remove it, um, we use oxytocin, so drugs to make contractions of the uterus. We then often fill up the uterus with fluids because it will allow us to kind of feel where is this placenta still attached. And sometimes just by filling it up, you kind of feel oh, it's just a little bit and just by twisting gently and feeling you can um, um, release that uh, placenta safely from her uterus um, and we always check the placenta for completely so it's very important that once the placenta is out put it in a bucket um, put it away so the dogs can't have it put it away uh, preferably not in the sun as well um, because it starts to be very very smelly but as well it dries out and if it's dried out um, certain pathologies are difficult to um, really um, examine when, when on a dry placenta. Um, and then uh, placentitis. So um, the itis in placentitis stands for inflammation and it's an infectious um, process, mostly by bacteria. And they go by in, in horses mainly by ascending. So they go through the vulva lips um, and then into the cervix and you get infection there. Um, less frequent uh, via the blood or, uh, or by previous infection and contamination. So like a little nudus in the uterus, but mainly it goes through the cervix and then it's asc uh, ascending. And that's why we do Catholic uh, uh, procedures 
Um, so a mare like this in this picture, um, when she kind of poos, the poo will go on her vulva. And if you wouldn't have done a castling, she will contaminate her uterus and uh, potentially this might induce a placentitis. Um, as well, mares that had uh, difficult fallings where there have been a lot of pulling um, on, on during parturition, it's, they might have cervical defects and they will initially be pregnant and it will all go well. But once the, you go into a more advanced stage of your, um, of your gestation, so she's getting, the fall is getting more heavy and there's more fluid, there, you get more pressure against that cervix. And if you don't have a cervical defect, it might be prone to have um, um, bacteria in, entering there and then uh, cause a placentitis. Um, or as well, we had it as well when people think the mare isn't in fall or there is um, a stallion next to the mare and she, she get covered anyway. Um, we had um, some placentitis and abortion caused uh, by that as well. So um, the problem with placentitis is so you have um, inflammation of your placenta and you get edema. And with edema, you get swelling. So those little finger things will swell again and you get separation of your placenta. And so you have your nutrition, your oxygen supply will be compromised. Um, the diagnosis um, can be done um, by um, the first sign often is, is um, vaginal discharge, but we, we, we often miss that because it's sticking to the tail and, and you don't really see it on the vulva often. It can be very, very discreet as well. But the main thing I get um, with placentitis is people calling me, my mare has another, but she's not due for another two months. And that is something that is uh, very, um, indicative for having a placentitis um, and basically she will produce actively milk uh, in those cases as well and that is when you really need to call us out and if we are on time and with aggressive treatment you can uh, try to kind of um, treat the placentitis and hopefully have a mare that falls to term. Um, Mares won't get systemically ill with a placentitis. Um, they won't have a fever. So it's just something that um, I always advise when you have mares that are uh, pregnant, don't just go and feed them and look, oh yeah, they look round, but just have a look as well. Like look at quick, look under their other daily, just see if there's changes and those things are important to kind of um, discover them on time. Um, so this is the placenta um, which had placentitis. So here you have your horns. And then what you hear here is the opening from the cervical star. You have your amniotic sac where normally the, the, the legs would be in. And then if you see here, this, there's a clear demarcation. And what happens is that on this left side, this is normal and it's nicely attached. But it has entered, so bacteria have entered the cervix and started to kind of spread and spread and spread towards uh, more inwards. So all this bit here wasn't really nicely in contact with the uterus anymore. Um, and then um, just one quick thing on, on equine herpes virus, because I do think, um, especially um, at the moment, a hot topic, but I think it's very important to know um, that equine herpes virus can uh, cause, together with all other viruses, um, abortion. And the main um, strain is EHV1, um, um, which will cause uh, what we call a vasculitis, so an inflammation of your blood vessels, and which can then result in, in abortion. Um, so vaccination um, gives protection against the respiratory form of VHV, um, which is mainly the EHV4 form, as well as abortion. However, unfortunately, not 
to the neurologic one. Um, so vaccination in normal uh, cases two times a year. However, for pregnant mares, we booster at five, seven and nine months of gestation. Important as well is herd management. Um, and that is not only for um, EHV, but as well for other um, viruses is separate your pregnant mares from your not pregnant mares if you have, if you can. Um, do not introduce new uh, horses with your pregnant mares because you never know where they have been in, what they were carrying, and I, um, and as well, keep young stock and transient mares, uh, horses away from your pregnant mare. I think with the whole COVID situation, we do understand a bit epi uh, epidemiology like that a bit better, and it's just very important to kind of minimize the risk of um, abortion because EHV, if you have it on a yard with. Um, a lot of pregnant mares and they're not vaccinated and you don't really have any isolation protocols um, in place, it can cause abortion and actually what we call an abortion storm with uh, multiple mares aborting um, their, their falls. Um, and then finally, um, and this will all be sent to you at the end as well, um, somewhere during the week um, with, together with the notes, is um, have a little sheet, a little check uh, sheet, um, what, what shall I do? So on top, I will have the mare, the stallion and the estimated due date. Do remember a due date is maybe not the exact wording to use because horses, um, have a, a normal gestational length from 320 to 360 in uh, two days. Um, as well, those are the vaccinations we do. Um, ha if she's Catholic, make sure her Catholic is open on time. Um, a little bit on the prediction of falling um, and then the stages of labor, so first stage labor. Um, if it takes longer than four hours, call the vet, second stage labor. If you have a red bag, if you had I have seen a head but there's no leg swimming or you have a head but there's only one leg call us um if the placenta hasn't passed within three hours call us um also and we'll talk a bit more in two weeks regarding the newborn fall um but if your fall is not going external so not trying to sit up within five to ten minutes that is um um, considered a problem as well. She, they should stand within an hour. They should be nursing within two. They should start passing me to me coning after three hours and it should be complete after 24. Um, and then we do advise if all went well to have a your full check to the next day. Um, and um, we do an antibody test on the falls after 12 hours after they started nursing. Um, so I hope to all enjoy to talk and, and I didn't make it too academic and you all learned something as well and, and if there's any questions I'm more than happy to, to answer them all. Thank, thank you Katja, that was uh, another really good and informative talk and I think it's covered a lot of the questions but once again we still have got an awful lot of questions and probably too many to answer. Um, I am going to ask you just a few questions. Um, what would be your um, what would be your treatment protocol if you did identify a mare with placentitis? Um, so I would go and uh, the first thing I would obviously do is, is scan the mare and and we look at kind of um, the placenta. Um, uh, transrectally, we would see if there's any thickening with uh, of the placenta as well. Uh, sometimes you find kind of pus packets. Um, I would put them on broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, I would uh, potentially put them as well on regimate on not a standard dose, but double dose um, and um, use um, an anti-inflammatory, um, which uh, but that probably with thyrococcid, which has a, a good penetration towards your placenta as well. Um, so that's the thing. You kind of want to attack it as, as much as possible with broad spectrum antibiotics, with um, anti-inflammatory and trying to keep um, that uterus quiet. What I do advise as well is because there is a placentitis, there is a chance she might abort. So 
have a very close eye on the mare because if she aborts, abortions often are um, dystocious because falls um, actively help in the repositioning during um, um, birth and with a placentitis and a compromise the fall might be dead and then will not actively turn and then um, intervention might be necessary so in cases of placentitis keep a close eye on them um, and uh, to avoid as well in the unfortunate event if the fetus didn't survive that you don't do more damage to your mare than, than if you can avoid that. Thank you. So the, the fact that a mare might have placentitis is, I suppose, directly linked to the fact there's a risk of a red bag, that inflammation of the, the yes. percentage that we've described and discussed several times uh, this evening already. Um, the in your experience, have you had mares that have had placentitis year after year and then gone on to have a, a red bag delivery each year? Um, yes, we see that. So uh, one of the reasons might be um, cervical problems, so problems with the cervix that isn't um, um, closing very well. There are, um, some people do um, do cerclage of the, cer of the cervix, so they really, kind of um, stitch the cervix to kind of, but then you really need to be, you, you, have, you will need to have a hospital um, falling just because it needs to be opened on time and it's, it's quite risky. Um, other cases as well in, in certain mares, they, they have a very used uterus, a very older mares where the, the placenta isn't as sufficient and so there's some the connection between isn't as high. So you have um, a higher chance if you once had a placentitis to, re, to have it repeatedly. And so I do advise in those cases um, to scan them um, regularly to kind of, um, even if you don't see a um, uh, lactation, a premature lactation yet, but really scan them to kind of um, recognize it before it actually uh, starts to spread. What, what would be your um, thoughts on having oxygen available at um, the birth of a, a foal for a mare that has um, got placentitis, placentitis and possibly is going to go on and have a red bag delivery? Do you think there's any, any value in having oxygen present for foalings? Um, I don't really think so, and it's been, um, there's been some recent research as well that actually over supplementing oxygen isn't really helping. I do think that having um, an ambu bag present, so basically really keeping oxygen like that is, is important, um, and that will, but if, actually, if real oxygen support um it's necessary then i do think it needs to be done in a, in a hospital setting and um that little bit of oxygen often you have too much oxygen if you would just give it um straight like that and um so i think the most important i would rather invest in having an ambu bag than, rather than having oxygen tanks present that's great uh, if we move on to retain retain percenters um one of the treatments for retained placentas is using oxytocin uh, injections. Uh, what, how many hours after foaling with an retained placenta would you use oxytocin? What volume would you use? And how many injections would you give before you changed your uh, method of treatment for that retained placenta? Um, so what I often, I have clients who have oxytocin. If the have, placenta hasn't passed within let's say two hours, I would give oxytocin, I would tell them, look, you can give some oxytocin, but I do only give half a mil. Um, whereas in, for after, uh, because the oxytocin receptors are just all very present at birth. Um, so you don't want them to go in an actual cramp neither. You want them to have those nice contractions. Um, and then often um, I probably would be on my way and have a check and when I'm there, I might give her an hour later another a shot and then um, have a little look and wash up the mare uh, nicely and see if I can um, either, um, if it's very attached or not. You can um, 
give an infusion as well and let it go slowly like that. Um, it all depends on the setting um, on the art as well, what, what you want to do. But, um, and then you kind of fill up the uterus to have a feel where it is. And, and a technique that I actually really like and, and um, is something we, um, um, a Dutch vet started doing and you still have the umbilical vessels present in the amnium. And basically what they do is bring water through those. And so it will bring water in all the vessels and you will kind of induce what you, that oedema that you have with a placentitis, you get swelling and it just fills it all nicely up and the placenta will just drop out of it without, uh, with reducing the risk of actually tearing that placenta. Um, we're, we're still getting loads and loads of questions coming in. I'm not sure how many more we can answer. I'm going to ask you a different one now, um, moving back onto the, the very, very hot topic at the moment of herpes virus. Um, we know that mares should be vaccinated at five, seven, and nine months of gestation to hopefully afford some sort of protection against herpes virus if they were exposed to it to protect them against abortion. Um, if you had mares that are not vaccinated following that schedule, and given what's happening in Europe currently as far as herpes type 1 is concerned, would you advocate anybody giving vaccines now? And what, what would your protocol be? This is just for info mares, bearing in mind what's going on. Um, I'm just interested to see your thoughts on that. So you mean if they haven't been vaccinated and they're over their five, seven and nine month kind of, um, it's um, what I would suggest if they're, if they're nine months through there, it's no point. What, but I do sometimes have people kind of like they're at six, seven, seven months and I might just do seven and nine or um and do those however when you have actually a chance there's no point if you think there is herpes on your yard to to vaccinate at that point because it just what i mainly would suggest as well is keep your yard close as close as possible as well try not to go um for mares um to your to, from from your competition horses in the city touching them touching their nose and then go and pet your um, your um, pregnant mares because it can carry on your hands as well and try to avoid that really try to kind of wash your hands change your clothes in between if needed and minimize but I do think that vaccinated at six months is, is still fine and will still give some protection there as well yeah that that's good advice and I think the other thing to bear in mind is that the the um, the advice about vaccinations is if there's ever any risk of infection actually being present in the yard that vaccinating when you've got a little outbreak is not uh, advisable because you could actually make the situation a lot worse